Hello, I'm Peter Moore, and welcome to Travels Through Time, the podcast made in partnership with Colourgraph. So it's early 1963, you're part of the huddled mass inside the legendary Cavern music venue in Liverpool and you decide that it's time to nip outside for a cigarette. Outside the streets are white and the air is sharp, it's been snowing on and off for weeks. On the TV they're describing the hills of the Peak District as looking like the Alps of Europe. You don't quite know it yet but you're living through one of the most extreme British weather events of the 20th century, an event that will linger long in the collective memory. This is a story that the writer Juliet Nicholson describes in her fabulous new book, Frostquake. In the book, Nicholson goes in search of the human stories that took place against the bitter weather of early 1963. There's the story of the poet Sylvia Plath, in London, the campaigning journalist Harry Evans in the north of England, there's the models on the King's Road, and of course there's the band in Liverpool that are poised to take over the world. Here is Juliet Nicholson taking me on a travel back through time. Welcome to Travels Through Time, it's a real pleasure to be talking to you Juliet Nicholson. It's such a treat to be here, thank you so much for having me Peter. Well, I'm looking out the window, the snow's falling softly, so we've got the perfect backdrop to your book, Frostquake, which I think, do you want to introduce it to us and explain it in your own words? I mean, maybe even starting with the title, actually, which is a a strange word that I didn't make up. It encapsulates exactly what seems to have happened during this winter of 1962 to three when it started to snow on Boxing Day and didn't really stop for 10 solid weeks. And during that time, when there was a kind of variety of lockdown in which the transport systems ground to a halt, an icy, slithered to an icy halt, all sorts of things started happening in that quiet, peaceful, place where we go when we can't rush around the roads and the airports and the trains and frostquake is a term that I found in a sort of biological dictionary which I happen to have on my shelf the definition of which is a seismic event caused by a sudden cracking action in frozen soil (laughs) and um, it seemed to me that that was a description of what happened during the course of that very very snowy winter nearly 60 years ago you're right it works so beautifully metaphorically as well because you've captured this moment which is so full of change political change social change changing attitudes it's quite a story there's something you write at one point which is The details of these strange cold days remain vivid in the collective memory more than 60 years later. It was a winter that people remembered, not just on the personal level, but for, as you say, Peter, these other huge things that were going on. It was a winter with a backdrop of a cold war. We just emerged um, from the crisis of the... um, Cuban Missile threat, which had taken place in uh, October 1962, when it was felt that we were within a whisker of a third world war, in that case, a nuclear war. And the Russian intimidation was all pervasive. And Jack Kennedy, who was the president of the United States at the time, had been told in his inauguration that if a third world war, if a nuclear war were to come, a third of humanity would be wiped out. It's not surprising really when so many people were still alive who not only remembered the second world war, but also uh, the first. Mm. 
and the Spanish flu that had come straight after it. Yeah, I think you're right. At one point, there's this really um, disquieting pattern, which people have noticed that in the 20th century to that point, there'd been a, a catastrophic war every 20 years until yeah. 1960. So it was, seemed like, once again, things were deteriorating. And I suppose that adds to this slightly eerie backdrop to the snow, which... Um, I mean, we can look at snow in so many different ways because obviously it's a it's a vehicle of wonder. You know, when children look at you know the snow, they their eyes are always a little bit wider. You can go out and play in it and have the snowballs. But then, um, I think it's important to say there's quite a lot of emotional range within your book. One of the chapters which I found um, really really touching was about Sylvia Plath, of course, who's in London yeah. in the early months of 1963 and it's against that backdrop of of frozen roads and slippy streets that she um has her emotional descent yes absolutely so beautifully put peter um her relationship with um the poet ted hughes her husband had come to a dreadful end when he went off with one of their own, their mutual friends and uh, she was reeling from the after effect of this breakup and had come to live in London um, in a flat with her two tiny children. One of them wasn't even one years old and the other one was um, just not even three. And she was an American living in London on her own, not exactly friendless, but very, very lonely. And the way she coped with this spiralling despair was to write. And so the sort of irony is, I suppose, in this dreadful way, is that the most exquisite and dramatic and long lasting of all her poetry are those poems that when she wrote them in the winter, in the snow, when it was so hard to get out and even buy milk and bread for her children, uh, slipping and sliding all over the place, not having enough money, not having enough heat. And uh, out of this came these extraordinary pieces of creative writing. Yeah, I think so. There's a, there's a quote from Sylvia where she writes, that weather affects me intensely. And maybe this is one of these things that when we're looking at the art, when we're looking at the poems, we, we forget the context that they're written in. And it's always difficult to make that connection between weather and events, because sometimes it can seem too frivolous in a way. Yes, of course. I mean, as you say, you know, the, 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 the sort of the joy of it, the magical transformation of a familiar landscape into something Narnia-esque is, is really what really almost all of us respond to initially. But while the sort of joy and delirium of, of, of rushing around in this, in this frosty whiteness can kind of stay with children and maybe they don't have to go to school. And, you know, this was a time in 1962 when um, coal fires were still um, the way, the means to heat a house. There, were, there was no central heating or anything like that. And of course, pipes were bursting mm. all over the place. And so I, I remember myself uh, queuing in the street for a standpipe to get water in a kettle to take home to pour into our, into our baths. So it's a you know, it's a double-edged thing, a snowfall. It is, and there's this, um, another quality of the book, which is really enjoyable, is this sense of simultaneous experience, because as we know that, um, but because the book's like a panorama, you will, you'll kind of dive in on a particular story, which will enliven a theme, but we know that as Sylvia Plath might be writing her poems in London, you and your father, for example, are having your escapades on these frozen lakes. And I've got to ask you about this story when he takes you out over the water. Yes. Well, we were we were at school in London, but um, at the weekends we went um, down to 
spend the weekend in Kent, which was one of the places that was most dramatically affected by this unprecedented snow. The winds were so huge that drifts were a uh, height of four men. Uh, Kent and Sussex particularly um, affected by this. And we had a, 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 there was a lake near our home, which had um, frozen over miraculously um, deeply. And my father and I went to walk on it. We had no skates. Shops had sold out of skates months before, um, but we had Wellington boots. So we slithered along. I can remember it as I speak it to you now. Um, with absolute moment by moment as we walked out into the middle of the lake and I started to put my feet on top of his feet as we, as we walked further and further into the middle. And suddenly he slipped and I slipped with him and he was a tall, big built man and he crashed on top of me, who was eight and quite small and slight and unconscious. I was lying there on, on the ice. And actually, for years afterwards, my father would mention that um, that incident as one of the worst because he thought he he thought that was it. He thought he'd crushed his daughter. And I think you, you, you finished that paragraph with, thank goodness my mother never found out or something. <laughs> well, that was his so, initial reaction was, I mean, I was barely, I barely come round. You know, I was still seeing sort of Tom and Jerry type stars in front of me. Yeah. And he said, well, he's got good instincts for self-preservation in that case. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly, you do. OK, well, that's it, it. What could have been quite tragic is happily for us a charming anecdote. And um, I want to get into the format of this podcast now, um, which is hopefully going to take us to some more really lively stories. I know it will do. And it begins with me asking you this question, which I ask of everyone that comes on, which is if you could travel back through time, which year would you pick? If I could travel back through time, I would love to return to the winter of 1962 to three. Okay. Because it was a very important and significant winter in which I was eight years old. Perfect. Well, let's do this in three scenes. Where would you like to go first, please? Well, first, I'd like to go to a scene in which I actually appear but I would love to go back there just almost um, as an observer. It's a bit like Scrooge in A Christmas Carol, this one, to, to look back at a former self, maybe. It is, it is. It's looking back on my younger self, not to have a conversation with her or anything, no. but sort of knowing secretly what I know now, nearly 60 years later. Uh, and that little girl, aged eight, obviously had no idea about and we were living in London, just off the King's Road, right down at, at the very end where it's called actually World's End. And every morning um, I would take the bus to school on my own. Uh, made me feel extremely grown up. And in this very snowy winter, actually, quite often the bus wasn't running and I had to um, get a lift with my dad. The diesel in the buses would, would freeze up. But when I when it was running, um, I would take the bus and the bus conductor gave you a ticket from an enormous machine that he had hanging around his neck on a great sort of strap. And out of this out, out of the machine, he would roll a ticket. There was something terribly sophisticated, I felt, mm. about holding my own ticket and sitting on the bus on the top floor, double decker bus. Uh, number three to eight. This seems very advanced to me, I must say, at the age of eight. It's maybe very advanced. It, it does. I mean, eight-year-olds yeah. nowadays, to put them on a bus would seem would seem very brave, I think. But there was no nothing to fear. Mm. What was there to fear? I mean, we didn't think there was anything. My brother was three years younger than me, and he also took the bus up the King's Road on his own, aged five. Okay. Oh no, no, we were very, we were very independent. <laughs> 
And I remember we would we were walking um, from the bus stop to my school, which was in um, just off the Gloucester Road in in London, um, with the snow sort of pricking my face. And uh, we didn't have any uniform at my school. So I had a dress which was very 60s in that it was something called a shirt waster. It had no waist. It was bright red and it had silver buttons all the way down the front. And I wore this dress as often as I could. And I had a balaclava, which covered most of my face and mittens lined with rabbit fur. And my favorite lesson, was English and my English teacher was always late and she would come running into the classroom honestly at a sort of she at a tilt her red hair in a bun already sort of falling out and all the way around her face our exercise books that she'd taken home to mark with her red pen in a paper bag that was already dripping and falling from the snow and she would sit on the desk, not behind it, and read us stories. I don't ever remember doing any grammar, which may be why my publisher has such a problem when I turn in my books. But <laughs> it was stories that she would tell us. Her name was Mrs Fitzgerald, and her first name, which we didn't know at the time, was Penelope Fitzgerald. And she was glamorous because she lived on a houseboat in on the River Thames in Chelsea. And her eccentricity and her mystery and her disheveled, wonderful bohemian appearance was just so unlike anybody else that we were taught by. And what she would read us was Dickens. She would read Tale of Two Cities. And she would talk about the tricoteurs and she'd talk about the French Revolution. She was obviously teaching us. She was also a history teacher. So in this particular book, obviously, literature and history were all wrapped up in one. And it was an absolutely mesmerizing experience sitting on this desk with her, the sort of snow still dripping out of her holy boots they had holes in the bottom of them we thought that the boots I thought when I was eight in that classroom that the boots had holes in because she sort of didn't care because she was so we had these words these new words which was with it and super and groovy <laughs> which we all used as often as we could and I thought she was all those things what I didn't know and the little, the grown up me that's sitting in the corner of this classroom after accepting your invitation, Peter, to return in time to, 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 to be there again. What I didn't know is she was living in abject poverty in this boat, which was so full of holes itself, not just her boots, but her house, her home, her boat that it was beginning to tilt into the River Thames. I didn't know that she was living with her alcoholic husband. I didn't know that the reason that she was popping little bits of chalk into her mouth as she spoke to us was not because she was odd and marvelous and strange, which all of which she was, but because she was hungry. And this completely unforgettable character, this woman who introduced me to a love of, of reading, of literature, of writing, of history, was going many years later to become one of our most famous novelists. Mm -hmm. And uh, Penelope Fitzgerald won the Booker Prize. She certainly and, did. I mean, author of The Blue Flower and so many other magical works. Exactly. And it's, I think magical is the right word, really, to imagine being taught by her as an English teacher. Was she at this point published at all or was she just a teacher? What was that just a, a profession for her or was she um, doing what, I don't know, Aldous Huxley did when he taught for a year at Eton, for example? 
oh no, it wasn't like that at all for her. No, no, no. She was, she was earning the money for the. For, she, had, she had two daughters, a bit older than 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 I was, but still, you know, young young children, and then this husband who had been a very distinguished uh, man of law, but had been um, during that winter he was um, found. I think he had stolen something from his um, office. Anyway, he was arrested and barred from the barred from the law. He lost his job, I and mean, it was she was going through catastrophe. But I think that while she was in the classroom and seeing that we, her students, were entranced by. What, what thrilled her too, which were these great, great classic stories that she was having the privilege of passing on to us. I think she felt that. Mm. I think she was in a sort of um, vacuum when she was there. In the I mean, I'm, I'm sitting here with a great big smile on my face because this is such a, <laughs> it's such a great projection of, of what it must have been like in, you know, this cold London yeah. environment inside the little schoolroom with, with a magical teacher. It's got all these elements that you have to find appealing. Hermione Lee's masterly biography of her has just taken me back to, and filled in gaps that I obviously didn't know about when I was little. But then I did go, there was a very beautiful um, funeral she had a memorial service in in St James's Piccadilly, very very grand, you know this grand Wren church, for our our sort of slightly scrumpled school teacher, and in that memorial service they very brilliantly played her voice, a, an interview that she'd done on the BBC, and it came through the um, whole sound system. And I remember sitting in that church, listening to this voice, the power of the voice, just absolutely back in my eight-year-old self again. Oh, this is, yeah, this is really brilliant. I should ask you as well, for, for, for listeners who have not read any of Penelope Fitzgerald's novels, do you have a good place for them to start? I should just ask you this as a sideline as we're going. Well, you really should read Offshore. Offshore. <laughs> anybody should read Offshore um, because it is the story of her heartbreak but it's also for history lovers anybody who's listening to your podcast Peter gets a very very vivid detailed sense of life in the King's Road of what those cafes were like of this incredible sort of duality of the old guard these uh, this you know the bowler hatted umbrella furled uh, smarty pants who lived in the in the sort of posh end of the king's road looking aghast and askance at the skirts walking out of mary quant's shop at the at the, at the top end of the, of the king's road and um, her descriptions of the great sort of fashion parade that was beginning to take over this ancient walkway of the King's Road in Chelsea um, are second to none. And they're first hand. She must have been writing them in the early 60s when, when she was my Well, perfect. As, as we've taken our listeners into a classroom, it seemed only right that we send them away with a little bit of homework. So that's a good novel to go and enjoy. Let's move on to your second scene. We're going to leave Mrs. Fitzgerald's English class behind. Where would you like to go to next, please? Well, I really can hardly resist going to meet the Beatles. I have been a Beatles fan since 1962, when the first of their records came out, Love Me Do. And in the winter of 1963, they were, at the very beginning of the winter, they were not really known outside Liverpool and the northern clubs that they were playing in. Four joshing, irreverent, sort of gum-chewing, cigarette-smoking, chicken sandwich-eating foursome <laughs> who were um, on stage behaving in a way that 
pop groups just didn't. And also they were sort of gorgeous and flirty and loved their audience and were clearly having the time of their lives. Anyway, in Oldham, in the Astoria, the Astoria Ballroom, this was the moment that everything began. And I would like to have been not only in the audience that night in the Oldham Astoria, but I would like to have joined them where they went afterwards. Because what happened was the word had got out that their record, Please Please Me, had gone to number one in some of the music charts. And the capacity of the Astoria Ballroom was 800, but three times that many had turned up that night. And there was mayhem and they had no professional security or anything like that. And there was a, a few sort of um, moonlighting cafe owners who volunteered to be sort of security guards. But this one girl broke through the moonlighting cafe owners and managed to get onto the stage with the Beatles who were singing, please, please me, at which 75 other fans furious that she this one woman had got so close to these idols that they also burst through and her dress that she was wearing a black dress was was ripped from her back and someone got a photograph of it which I've I've actually put in my book with this sort of exposed back this woman you can see her underwear underneath it with these sort of crazy young women who have all simultaneously fallen in love with this band from Liverpool. Yeah. And we, after the event, they were invited to go back to a um, house that, that belonged to a friend of Paul's dad's. Um, and the reason that they'd accepted to go back and have a cup of tea in this unlikely place um, they'd never heard of this family who owned this house before, except that they, it belonged to a friend of Paul's dad's, was because there was a promise of cheese sandwiches and chocolate cake. <laughs> and they were starving. And uh, the facilities at that time in the, in the, in the, in the sort of dressing room um, of bands that were um, on these tours were just hopeless. You know, they all shared, shared one room. It was a sort of absolutely very very basic things so the prospect of being invited back to a nice warm house um, with cheese sandwiches and chocolate cake they said amazing so I would like to have gone back with them to this house which was owned by a family called the McCanns and I spoke to Liz McCann who was um, 11 at the time and she knew about the Beatles because she'd seen them on the local, they'd been on the local television, on the Granada television. And she knew about them. And she was, her father came back and she said, he said, the Beatles are coming back for sandwiches and cake. <laughs> quick, quick, quick. And Mrs. McCann quickly, quickly rustled up the sandwiches. And in walked these lads who were just so funny and charming and hello Liz aged 11 how are you love mm. and um, sit down on Liz McCann's three-piece suite they light the, the fire in the sitting room and they eat the sandwiches and they Liz told me this just not very long ago uh, 60 years later that she sat on her leather sofa staring at Paul McCartney as if she'd never seen a human being or a god anyway in her sitting room before. He was wearing a green polar neck sweater. She couldn't take her eyes off him. She said to me at that very moment, she knew what love meant. Well, <laughs> <And> I... <laughs> listen, we. where do you start with this? I think it's it's again almost equally charming we could talk about the Beatles all day but I think one thing that you've captured here which is so important especially about this this moment when the Beatles were appearing out of 
Liverpool and they were coming into the national conscious, which would soon be a global phenomenon. They were they were very funny. We could be very serious about the Beatles now and look at how they changed culture and how they, you know, did things with um, musical kind of arrangements and so so on. But it was this sense of cheekiness and difference and willingness to to break conventions. I know there's that famous in- interchange between George Harrison and George Martin when he says. The, the problem is your tie for a start. It's this kind of irreverence for the slightly older established generation. And I think we'd probably see a bit of that in this scene. Absolutely. I mean, it, here was a generation who, uh, a young generation, teenagers who had not known war. You know, they were, they were different. They, they, they didn't have all that sort of baggage. They were looking for people of their own generation to represent them. And, you know, there were others. There were, there were, I mean, Cliff Richard was um, singing then very successfully, but he didn't have the kind of um, looseness and the sort of spontaneity and the somehow or other he was sort of quite old even though he wasn't old and you know what what that generation wanted was Elvis you know they wanted that but he was over the other side of the Atlantic where was our Elvis where is this you can do you can do anything you want really you can even eat a cheese sandwich on stage and get away with it it was that sort of failure to well sort of stop refusal to observe the sort of conventions the propriety you know they didn't they, their hair was so long you could barely see their eyes yeah. you know philip norman the great sort of biographer of the beatles said that it, they, their hair was like a grenadier's busby <laughs> came it's you know it it interrupted their eyelashes yeah. and then the other thing is as well about this period of history with the Beatles is that you you realize how off the cuff it was I mean they'd nip into Abbey Road and record an album and it would take a day and then they'd be off somewhere else and um that sense of I suppose we have a dovetailing here actually with the um with the cold weather because there's this slightly comedic Scottish tour that they go on a month earlier on in in January where they're watched by I don't know six Scottish farmers in a in a small you know, pub or something like this but they they have to endure the cold by sleeping on top of one another in what they call the beetle sandwich where they have to kind of revolve round so they can kind of exchange the heat so that's right I mean it was very very unsophisticated <clears throat> um I mean the snow and the weather and the ice if you're if you're if you're crossing sort of snake pass and your windscreen blows out and you're already lying on top of your drum kit you know you're not you're not wild superstars that you that you would be by the end of that year you know um, it was really, they, there they were, d- d- singing in front of the Queen Mother in November. I quite like the fact in the book as well, that the Beatles are kind of like a, a looming character, if I can use that cliche to describe them, because they're always the four lads from Liverpool who are on the, you know, the kind of edge of people's, um, you know, kind of vision throughout the first half of the book. And then they start to appear in their own right with, please please me and and the other songs and um yeah, i mean it's just i think that um you know it, it, it's it's sort of what, what i really hadn't quite focused on is that actually liverpool was so cutting edge itself it was on the edge of it's on the edge you know it's on the mercy icebergs were floating up and down that Mersey, but the other side of the Mersey, well, across the Atlantic, is New York. So this sort of neon lit world, which the uh, ships that were going between the port, as they had done for you know centuries, between Liverpool and 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 New York, um, were bringing back the kind of tantalising glimpses of blue jeans and boot you know bootleg records, and so sort of Liverpool had a kind of awareness of possibility. Um, that perhaps even London was needing to catch up with. Uh, 
it was a it was a it was a city of it was also the city of tremendous writers mm. and painters and it was hugely cultural melting pot at that at that time. Hello, it's Artemis. At Travels Through Time, we're incredibly proud to be partnering with Jordan Lloyd and Colograph. Jordan is one of the world's leading visual historians. Through his excellent craftsmanship, he brings black and white photographs of the past to life in startling colour and clarity. Jordan's extraordinary work, as well as that of his contemporaries, can be found on the website colograph.co. At colorgraph.co, you'll be able to explore the process and history behind the colorization work, but most excitingly of all, you can also buy some of these beautiful photographs as museum grade fine art prints. They make an unusual and striking present for that friend or family member of yours who loves the past, and they're an excellent addition to any room. Whether it's a colorized photograph of the US Capitol building from 1846, or a candid shot of the Beatles from 1964, you're pretty sure to find something that enchants you. I know I certainly have many times. It's hard to explain really over audio just how cool these prints are, so I encourage you to have a look for yourself at colorgraph.co. What's more, Travels Through Time listeners get 10% off when they enter the code TTT at the checkout. As I said before, we could talk about the Beatles because I'm a fan as well, and I know that you write in the book that you can almost, you know, arrange the biography of your your life, your autobiography around various Beatles songs that have been played at important moments. But we do have to charge on, and we've got one scene left. Where would you like to go for your third and final scene in these early months of 1963? Well, this is um, about a month later, uh, after the Beatles um, have had their number one. And we've moved now towards the end of the winter onto the 21st of March and to the House of Commons, to London. And I would like to go that night of the 21st of March um, in the company possibly of uh, David Dimbleby, who was a young news reporter of the time, okay. uh, who managed to, with no difficulty at all, walk that evening into the public gallery of the House of Commons to watch a debate and he, he wasn't um, aware that he was going to be sitting in the public gallery at some kind of moment changing um, event. But as it happened, it was the evening in which this rumbling Profumo crisis, uh, which had been the talk of the town, but not published in the newspapers, suddenly erupted in the chamber of the House of Commons. So I should, at this point, Uh, get you just to to frame what the Profumo crisis is. For those of us, because we have listeners everywhere, not just in the UK, um, although people might know about this crisis everywhere, but it was so important in the context of 20th century history. What was it about? John Profumo was a member of parliament and the minister for war in the Prime Minister Harold Macmillan's conservative government. John Profumo was rumoured to have had an affair uh, a year earlier in 1961 um, with a model called Christine Keeler. And she, in turn, was rumoured to have slept with a naval attaché called Ivanov, a Russian naval attaché, who was suspected to be a spy. And so the implication was that uh, John Profumo had had pillow talk with (laughs) Christine Keeler, uh, had told her some secrets as Minister for War, which she had then passed on to the Russians. And it was a time in which everybody was extremely jumpy about Russia, but also about spies, not reported in the press because the establishment protected itself and the press was too frightened of libel and of printing any stories without any evidence. And it was reaching a sort of crescendo. And 
One other thing that was significant was that the leader of the Labour Party, uh, Hugh Gateskill, had died in January 1963 and been succeeded by a far more straight talking, I don't know if one might say maybe man of the people, certainly a Beatles fan, Harold Wilson. And there was a sort of feeling that it was going to be more possible to attack this elitist establishment conservative government. And so that night of the 21st of March, a um, ally of um, uh, Harold Wilson, a close friend of his called George Whig, and a, and a female MP, one of the few female MPs, Barbara Castle, asked some questions about Christine Keeler, who had vanished from a court trial that was um, going on at the time to do with two of her boyfriends who were Jamaican and Antiguan drug dealers. Mm. It's a sort of side story, but it was a way in which George Whig MP and Barbara Castle MP could ask a question without directly making any allegations against Profumo. They raised the name of Christine Keeler. And David Dimbleby said to me that when the name, the actual speaking aloud in the hallowed chamber of the House of Commons, when the, the name Christine Keeler was uttered in public for the first time, there was an absolute sort of rush of oxygen leaving the place. Everybody gasped. And it was close enough, the inquiry was coming close enough for um, the Speaker of the House, as soon as the close of business on the night of the 21st of March came to an end in the Commons, it was at one o'clock in the morning, the Speaker ra rushed around to Profumo's house and got him out of bed and brought him to the House of Commons at the crack of dawn and said to him, did you sleep with Christine Keeler? Did you? And John Profumo said, no, I didn't. And the speaker said, uh, you are going to, um, the chief whip, I'm, I'm sorry to say, the chief whip said, you're going to have to come to the Commons in the morning and tell the, tell the House that you're innocent. And of course, he was as guilty as hell. And so the following morning, and if it was me and I was allowed to be there, um, even if David Dimbleby had gone home to bed, I would have stayed all night in the, in the gallery, in the public gallery, in order to retain my place. It's one of these moments of absolute political drama, isn't it? Because even though the story in itself, and you did a, an admirable job of condensing it down to a few minutes there, it's quite complicated. There's various characters. Um, the, the simple fact of the matter is that there's a kind of culture of um, protection within what you might term the establishment, you know, stories are not told that could be told and friends look out for one another but I suppose what David Dimbleby was saying when he said that Christine Keeler's name was mentioned is that in an instant that's kind of like a paradigm shift now things are going to be fair game that weren't before is that right as a kind of summary? I that is absolutely right I mean I one cannot really claim that a, the world changed or society changed within a matter of 10 weeks during one winter. But I think, at least I felt as I was looking at that, the course of those events of that winter, that light was shone on issues that could never be switched off again. And there were many of them during that winter, but one of them was this chief thing of the establishment protecting its own. It just wasn't going to go on being possible. Neither the, the press nor the public were any longer going to tolerate the fact that just because you'd all been at school together or you were all in one uh, government together, uh, or you all spoke in a certain way, or you were all members of a certain gentleman's club, or you weren't a woman, were you going to be able to get away with this anymore? It just wasn't going to happen anymore. 
And so when um, Profumo did come the following morning and had to sit in front of the packed house and me up in the gallery in time travel, <laughs> um, he made a statement in which he categorically denied that he had had anything other than friendship as a relationship with Keeler. And as he sat down, having made his statement, having lied so brazenly to the house, Harold Macmillan leaned over to near, who was sitting next to him. He just moved his body over and just patted him on the back. Well done, my boy. Of course, it was outrageous. And the press um, that day onwards just went absolutely at it, hell for leather. And uh, three months later, Profumo again had to um, return and say he had lied and uh, resign immediately. That was the end of June. his career. Yes, Macmillan himself was um, gone by the end of the year through health reasons. Um, and uh, he was succeeded briefly by another Conservative mem min uh, Prime Minister, um, Alec Douglas Hume, but only for a year. And then, and then Harold Wilson um, was elected uh, Prime Minister. And through him, all sorts of um, reforms to do with capital punishment, um, uh, decriminalization of homosexuality, uh, legalization of abortion, um, all sorts of um, reforms um, that needed to be done um, were done under his tenure. But it was, it all began, the light was being let in on um, bad practice through through that through that winter it's difficult to to write a book like this that roams so widely but because you've got this argument of change whether it might be through um the Windrush generation finding their feet or through the pill giving women more like kind of agency and choice over what's going on in their lives or the Beatles changing um the mood of Britain or the politics changing all these things do seem to have a seedbed in this in this time I've got one last question which takes us back into a bit of material history if anything which is if you could we've been to all these places um if, if you could put your hand back through the past and pick up one tangible object to bring back today what would you like I would love to put my hand deeply into the very, very holy and raggedy rucksack that Mrs. Fitzgerald used to cart about with her as she came into the classroom. And from that, I would like to retrieve her little notebook in which I feel sure she was writing the detail of those moments and which nearly 20 years or so later, she would turn into her magnificent novel. That's a wonderful object to ponder, to think about. Maybe it existed and, well, we'll just have to imagine. Juliet Nicholson, this has been so much fun and we shall leave it here. Thank you so much, Peter. I've had a lovely time talking to you. That was me, Peter Moore, having a hugely enjoyable trip back to 1963 with Juliet Nicholson. Juliet's sparkling new book is called Frostquake and it's been charming the critics over the past few weeks. It's available right now and we really do suggest that you check it out. To find out more about this episode and see a fabulous colourised image of the snow in 1963 from Colourgraph, do head to our website which is tttpodcast.com. If you did enjoy this episode, then please do consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or just writing to let us know. We always do love to hear from you. We'll be back, though, with another episode next week. But from me, for now, that's it. Thank you very much for listening.